age six, nine, six. Today's shiur is sponsored by B and Jerry Rosenfield. It's commemorate the yard site of these mother, Devora Bas, Brian Lachaya. No, no, no problem. Are you okay? okay. I can do that. No. <laughs> Right, baby. <laughs> the mm -hmm. the, uh, the earth is actually today, right? Oh. So we thank you for sponsoring me. The Divrei Torah be a skus with the Nisham of the Varbas, Brian Achaya, and Shlomo HaKohen. Uh, so thank you indeed. Okay. Last week, last week we had a shear here. And we talked a little bit about the difference between uh, Shabbos and Yom Tov. Mm -hmm. Different idea, Simcha versus Oneg. Uh, the idea of one of them, the Shabbos, uh, approaching it as if we are entering into God's zone, into the spiritual realm. And on the Chag, on the other hand, we are bringing God into the physical world, meaning we appreciate the physical world, we value it, we try to make our contribution to the physical world. The two approaches. So actually, Josh mentioned the fact that there is a different angle we've discussed in the past, the difference between Shabbos and Yom Tov. And we're going to talk a little bit about it, but first we have to look at this week's Parsha. At Parshat... Behar, on page 6, 96. And we are familiar with this seven-year cycle where you work the land for six years and you rest on the seventh. We are familiar with the rules and regulations that relate to that seventh year. On that seventh year, don't work the land, and even when you want to benefit from the land, don't treat it like yours. It should be open to everyone. So if you have a lemon tree, it is permissible for you to <laughs> enjoy the lemons and you can make lemons into lemonade. However, you have to be sure that your fence and gate is open where you could welcome others to benefit from the lemon and the lemonade as well. That is the Shemitah year. And then we are told that you should know that you count seven times these seven years, and then you have year 50. And year 50 is the Yovel, the Jubilee. And there again, there are guidelines that relate very similar. And in many of them, they are precisely the same. That the Jubilee year, the Yovel year, is like the sabbatical year. That is what we are told. However, if we analyze the text, with uh, a focus on detail, we'll sense that there is a significant difference. So look here, please, uh, on page 696, <coughs> verse 2, where Daber el b'nei Yisrael, Moshe is told, speak to the children of Israel. Ve'amarta <coughs> alehem, and you shall go ahead and tell them, and say to them, when you go ahead and you land, when you uh, settle in the land, the last two words, those are the ones we're going to focus on. It is a Shabbat la Hashem. Shabbat to God. <coughs> Fine? Now, if you look now, if you move forward to verse... 10 on the next page, on 6, 6, 9, 8, where we are talking about the Yovel. And the Yovel, we are told, starts off with this blast. They blow the shofar on the Yom HaKippurim to begin the year. And in verse 10 we are told, Vekidashtem, you, you shall sanctify. You hear this, Jewish people? You should go ahead and sanctify this 50th year. And you should go ahead and proclaim freedom throughout the land. And it is a yoveli, it is a jubilee. <coughs> it shall be for you. So it's interesting that when it comes to the Shemitah, 
We talk about Shabbat la Hashem. It belongs to God. This is God's Shemitah. When it comes to the Jubilee, another year, they're not going to be working the land. The land will rest. But this time we are told, number one, you're going to sanctify it. You hear this, Jewish people? You're going to go ahead and sanctify it. Number two, it is lachem. It is yours. You have control over it. It belongs to you. So what is the difference between the two? In other words, obviously the Torah is using different words to describe the essence of these days, where one of them it's God's and one of them belongs to us. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and try and understand uh, the difference between the two. You know, there's something interesting about Shabbos. Back to Shabbos for a minute. If you look at the prayers of Ma'ariv, <coughs> Shafrit, Mincha, there are different prayers. If you look at the core, the structure of our prayer is always that you have three opening blessings, the three closing blessings, and the core bracha, they are very, very different. Friday night, okay, so we've end, we finish the last of the first three, Akel Kadosh. we start off with Kiddash the Shabbos, no, right? Not the Kiddash, no. Kiddash, right? <laughs> Sanctification of Shabbos, that's Friday night. When we move on to the morning, when we come here, we have a different text, and that's Yismach Moshe Bematnas Chalko. Yismach Moshe. And then we move on to Mincha. Mincha. Ato Echad, you are one. Shimcha Echad, your, your name is one. And who are like, like the Jews, right? No one like the Jews. Okay? What's the idea? Why is it? It's very interesting. On a Chag, you're not going to find that shift. It's always a that's what we have in a Chag. There's no need for a change. On a Chag, you don't get bored of the same prayer. You can do the same one, repeat it three times, and we're fine. For Shabbat, and we don't have that during the week either, right? Shachris, Mincha, Marv, it's exactly the same. Come Shabbos, we have to go ahead and make that uh, adjustment. What's it all about? So if you would uh, hear from a uh, Hasidic source, they would say to you the following, that Shabbos is like a marriage. It's for us, it's as if we are married to the day. And there are stages as you enter into marriage. First there is what the rabbis call Hirusim, or it's called Kiddushim, where uh, the young man turns to the young lady, Hare at Mekudeshetli, Mekudeshet, that's the Hirusim. And then afterwards they have the what's known as the actual nisuin, the actual marriage that is achieved with those Sheva brachas under the chuppah. Right? And that's when the happiness, that's when they really come together. That's when, And the third stage is the yichud. When they come together, they are secluded in a room and they become one unit. So they will explain that Friday night is atokidash. The Friday night is like the erusin, like the engagement. Shabbos morning, we are developing that relationship. It's enhanced a little bit more with God. And therefore, it is, right? What? Yismach Moshe. There's happiness there. In other words, you become, you're ready, you know, you're married now. There's the happiness of marriage. And then the third prayer is, Ata Echad. You become like one Vayubla Basar Echad. You become one unit. Fine. Nice insight. However, the truth is, I'm not that we're saying the first half. It's not true. But the real idea behind it is that on Shabbos, we have three things in mind. There are three things we keep in mind. Number one, we remember creation. That's how we testify that there is a God, that God created this world. We may not have a full understanding of all the details, but it's a recognition that there is a creator. There's wisdom in nature. There's a creation for purpose. How do we proclaim that God <coughs> created the world? Well, that is basically addressed on the Friday night prayer, a prayer that you created the world. However, Shabbat can exist even before we show up. It's a natural cycle of seven days that exists even without the Jewish people knowing about it. Come the Jewish people in Egypt, and as they leave Egypt, Moshe Rabbeinu is informed that there is a day called the Shabbat. 
Yismach Moshes, we are addressing the knowledge the people of Israel have and the relationship they have with Shabbat when they are informed through Moshe Rabbeinu regarding that day. So that's the second prayer. Okay, Tikan Toshavs. Now, Musaf, remember, that's an extra prayer. So there the whole focus is more as if to compensate for the fact that we cannot bring the sacrifices. So it has its own, you know, it's something that God established it to bring the korbanot, but that becomes, that's the really the main focus there. Yes, there is a Musaf, but even the word itself, Musaf, it is like the addition. Right? I remember as a kid in Israel, you would buy newspapers on Friday, and it would cost more, because it had a Musaf, the Shabbat, it had the... You know, the own days when people bought newspapers, right? So it had the Musaf. Mincha is talking about this messianic, the future. Right? We're talking about the messianic era. There's going to be oneness. There's going to be recognition of the role of the Jewish people. Humanity will come together with God. That's what the third pr prayer is addressing. So this is another approach that is taken. Now, you know, we, we don't appreciate the existence of farming, I think, in many areas. And when was the last time, I still remember I was in, I think in Milwaukee, and I walked into a supermarket. And this was in a supermarket in an African-American neighborhood. And as I'm checking out, the, the, the cashier turned, looks at my hands, and she says, you probably don't work. I said, why do you say it? She looks at my hands and she says, you don't work. Your hands are so clean. Right? In other words, she looked at my hands. I didn't have any dirt or grime. Meaning it seemed to be, at least the shot I was giving afterwards, is that they, those who do work in those neighborhoods are mechanics, laborers, uh, people who actually use their hands. I, I was in Kolo, I didn't use my, I only used my thumb. <laughs> so I used my thumb, not my hands, and even when I used it, it was clean. So as a result, it looks like I didn't work. This is what I, this is what I was told in, in Milwaukee. Now, the farmer, the farmer is very much attached, you know, there's a connection to land, there's an appreciation of the land. And what we have to recognize is that messages that we get from lectures, lectures, messages we get from teachers, from our gathering here, from our uh, experience of a Shabbos in Shul, they simply did not have. The farmer, the farmer, would most probably interact with other members of the community three times a year. That's it. Right? Your, your parents, right? You lived out on a farm there. Was it eggs that you were raising there? Chickens. Chickens, chickens. Chicks, you raised the chickens who have eggs. What came first? Now, the, how often were they able to go ahead and interact with the community? Not, did they have a shul there? No. No. So this was the norm. This was uh, the norm. And it, even in North America, it did exist. If you ever hear of the Baron Hirsch, who wanted to uh, establish colonies a little bit in Argentina and in Mississippi, was done, believe it or not to create this new concept of Jewish farmers. He wasn't a Zionist, but uh, his intention was that Jews should actually relate to land. It's a different existence. And therefore, lessons that are fundamental, that we hope we gain through studying Torah and through hearing uh, talks and lectures, you, they were supposed to get from mitzvahs that relate to the land. The land was their teacher. And what we're going to try to fig uh, figure out here is that what lesson are they, are they supposed to take from the Shemitah and what lesson are they supposed to take from the Yovel? They are different. They are different. And what we're going to try to present here is the following. Shabbos and Yom Tov, they have, there's a significant difference, not just the one we addressed last week, but rather Shabbos has nothing to do with our doing. It is something that exists even without us. It existed, the cycle that existed started off, was there from creation before there was a Jew. The Jew was informed, and this is considered a gift to the people of Israel, 
that God tells us, guess what? There is a very special day. And that day is called the Shabbos. So it's yours. It's very, very special. It belongs to you. I'm giving you knowledge regarding the day itself. No one else is going to know about it. The Talmud uses the words that it's a matana tova, a good gift given to the Jewish people. We are told, right, the law, the tata, it wasn't given to the nations of the world. This is something that we inform. We don't play, now, when you get a gift, right, you don't do anything about it. Right? You, you're not the one that goes out. Miriam, sometimes it's kind enough that I need to get her a gift, so she'll go out and buy it for me, which is a chesed. But in general, <laughs> the ideal gifts, the ideal gifts are that I go ahead and I purchase it, and I wrap it, and I give it. That's the, considered a real gift. Now, Shabbos is a gift because we don't play, we do not play a, a role in creating it. We receive it, and it's very, very special. Who made it? Shabbat? It's God's. Shemitah relates to that it's, as well. It's a cycle. It is a seven-year cycle. We have no way of impacting it. And therefore, for the farmer working the land, when the sabbatical, when the seventh year comes, he remembers Shabbat la Hashem. God created the world. It's like the Shabbos. The messages, the mes the, the, the messages of Shabbos are supposed to be learned from the Shemitah. Shabbat la Hashem, as you see in verse 2. The Jubilee, on the other hand, is a different, is very, very different. I would like to share with you. The words uh, the Rambam uses regarding Shemitah. And he tells us, you should know, you think, let me, read, let me return to that, Shemitah itself is Shabbat Lashem. Let's move on to the Yovel. When it comes to the Yovel, I'm reading from the Rambam regarding the Yovel. Shlosha Dvarim Me'akvin Be'yovel. There are three things that if they are not performed, if they are not done, there is no Yovel. If you don't do it, there's no Yovel. Shemitah is on its own. Yovel, on the other hand, there are things that are me'akev, meaning there are those things that prevent it from coming into existence. And what are they? Tkia. If they don't blow the shofar in the beginning of the year, it's not a Yovel. Shiluach Havadim, if they do not emancipate, if they do not free the slaves, if they don't do it, it's not a Yovel. Hachzarat Sadot Lebalim, if people don't do it, Sheim Lo Asu Echad Megimel Varimel, if they were not performed, En Din Yovel Mutar Bachar Nishai, it's permissible. We, the Jewish people, we actually create the Yovel. It's not a gift. It is something that we do. How do we do it? Well, we go ahead, we create scholars, we create a betin, the betin goes ahead and performs what they are supposed to do, then we have a yovel. And that is like a chag. That is like a chag. In what way is that like a chag? In what way is the yovel, which is made by us, like a yom tov, because you know that when it comes to Shabbat and you want to go ahead and make the blessing of the day, you end your Kiddush or your blessings with Mikadesh HaShabbat. When it comes to Yom Tov, there is no such statement that God sanctified the Yom Tov. That's not the case. But rather what we say is Mikadesh Yisrael Vazmanim. God sanctified the people of Israel. By sanctifying us, we became special and we could create courts and we could create a bedin. And the bedin is the one that declares that there is a new moon. By the courts declaring that there is a new moon, we have a beginning of a month, and that's how the holidays are sanctified. That is like the yovel. So for the farmer, he learns the message of the Shabbat from the Shemitah, and the message of the significance of the Jew, what can be created by the Jew from the Yovel. Now, you know, it's interesting that, have you ever been in Philadelphia? You've been in Philadelphia. Anything to see in Philadelphia? Not too much? Okay, so Liberty Bell. Rocky. Rocky. Okay, what else do we have? <laughs> 
they have uh, Philly steaks. You know, there's a kosher place there for it. Philadelphia cream cheese, it obviously doesn't go with the steak, but <laughs> what you do have is the Liberty Bell. Right? Liberty Bell is more is known for its crack, meaning there is a, it, it was I think the first time they, uh, they used it, it got damaged. And it's one of those items that it's a little, there's a little bit of a challenge of returning it to the sender in the 18th century. Now, what are the words on the Liberty Bell, which is really uh, the symbol of, of, of liberty? Proclaim liberty throughout all the land, unto all the inhabitants. <coughs> Here we go. The Yovel. The words of the Yovel. Proclaim liberty. Now, by the way, these ideas of liberty, right, freedom, um, self-determination, right, we've heard, we hear these terms, right, the Wilsonian uh, view that, uh, you know, nations have the right to, to determine their identity, their boundaries, this, these were statements that were coming from the Americas, uh, you know, right after World War I, when colonialism is coming, or at least the Americans were hoping, was coming to an end. So these are the Wilsonian views, and this has in general been the policy of the United States of self-determination. If you listen uh, to the current president of the United States talking about the Palestinians, he talks about that the Palestinians deserve a state because of this idea, this view, Wilsonian view of self-determination. The only problem is, is that you don't if their, they are, their determination is to destroy Israel, there's a little bit of a problem there. In other words, self-determination makes sense. If you're determined to build yourself as a nation, your own identity, right? But if your whole <coughs> essence and what is being educated to your children is to uproot the people next door and throw them into the sea, so it's very, very questionable if that fits into the category of, uh, of self-determination. But these are, in essence, universal messages. In other words, if you would ask me for a, if they would call me, right, in the 1760s as they are, or whenever it was when they are etching those words into the Liberty Bell, is this an appropriate way of using verses? Is it appropriate to put psukim, right, on a bell that is not there for the, it's not going to be in a shul, but rather it's going to be there for a nation that is beginning their journey of freedom. It is 100% a universal concept. The Torah itself has been translated to other languages. A clear indication that there are indeed values that are Jewish, but they are for humanity as well. No question it's one of them. Now, the difference is that when it comes to the nations of the world, right, and you ask them, what is freedom for? Right? You want to proclaim liberty? You want to give people freedom? What is the purpose of freedom? So, in the United States, it is, right, life, right, and the uh, liberty and pursuit of happiness. That's it. You know, the happy, be happy. Okay, that's, that's what it, it's about. Now, happiness is important, but for Jews, happiness is a tool to go ahead and become even better than that. In other words, we believe in a spiritual mission. We believe that, yes, for all human beings, there is indeed a purpose in freedom. No question about it. Emancipation, that's incredible. Let people reach their full potential. Give the person the tools to go ahead and maximize and self-actualize. All these things are true, but for the Jewish person, there's something more than the physical. There's something that is about connecting to the higher being and even having the power to create in the spiritual realm. We create the Chagim. And if you look at all of the Chagim, they are made by us. They are made Mekadesh Yisrael Vazmanim. And we have a Pesach. And then we progress from Pesach. We progress and we have a Shavuot, which is a relationship with God. And then we progress from there because every, any relationship is not going to be really solid unless it goes through a challenging experience. And then you reconnect. And therefore we have that downtime, right? the failed period, which is the making of the golden calf, and we have that comeback where we recreate, we reconnect the Kodesh Baruch with Sukkot. 
for the Jews, we go ahead and utilize the freedom to go ahead and make something much, much greater. But the concept itself belongs to humanity. Now, again, look at the verse of the Yovel. Vekidashtem, you sanctify it. It belongs to you. Yovel, as we learned in the Rambam, Yovel is made by you. Yovel belongs lachem. It is something that you are creating. So for the farmer, while Shemitah is the message of Shabbat, being mindful of the fact that there is a creation, that there is a cycle made by God, when it comes to the Yovel, the message is, look at the power you have when you actualize. Look at the power you have when the Jewish people fulfill what they are supposed to do. You have the ability of sanctifying time. Okay. Now, it's interesting. You talk about holidays being sanctified by the Jewish people. So I'm going to ask you a question. In the days, in, in biblical times, and in the days when there was a temple in Yerushalayim, holidays were sanctified due to the fact that witnesses would make their way to the courts in Jerusalem. And, by the way, these witnesses coming to Jerusalem were extremely significant, important enough that they would violate the Shabbat. If someone would see the new moon, recognizing that today is indeed the first day of the month, so they were told you have every single right, if not an obligation, to make your way to Yerushalayim, inform the courts that we have the beginning of a month, and they sanctify the month. So you have people, people, who sanctify the month, and therefore you have the sanctification of Israel, which sanctifies the day. What happened after the destruction? Or what happened when by the 4th century, they no longer have those courts? Who sanctified the month? Who sanctified the Chagim? It's, it's a question that must be asked. Because if they weren't sanctified by anyone, and we are arguing that this is not a cycle, it's not like when it comes to the Shabbos, that all you need to know is that you look at your calendar, and you uh, keep track of a cycle, you reach day seven, you have yourself your Shabbos. When it comes to a Chag that doesn't work, it has to be made by man. It has to be made by the Rabbi sitting in the court. It wasn't done. I guarantee to you that there were no one, that there, it wasn't sanctified. This past Pesach, no one sanctified it. So the question is, why was there a Pesach? But people ask it often. But why was there? Why indeed was there a Pesach if it was not sanctified? So you're going to tell me what because of the cal because of the calendar, but that is not good enough. So now, by the way, this is a real question: Why the res? So, Rambam tells us that you should know. Rambam tells us. Every single holiday we celebrate outside of Israel is only a holiday because indeed it was sanctified in Israel. Meaning, what the way the words of the Rambam are explained is the following. When there are Jews in Israel keeping the Chag, they are acting like the court. When there are Jews in Israel that come Rosh Chodesh Nisan and they say it's Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Meaning it's not the calendar that gave us the date. The calendar is what told the Jews in Israel to treat day one of Nisan as day one of Nisan. And 15 days later to treat it as Pesach. That had the impact of creating the holiday. I'll quote to you the words of the Khatam Sofer, the great Hungarian authority, right, who passed away in 1839, who expre explains the words of the Rambam. That you should know, shanim vechodashim, the fact that we count months and years, zelo yo'il, it has zero impact. Holidays are not because of the calendar. It's not because the funeral home sent out a calendar. We know, and that's not the case. Ela, you know what's needed? When there is someone left in the land of Israel. Afilu, even, it's okay. Now, Chatam Sofer says, now don't think that you need to have in Israel this great rabbinic court. No, you need in Israel people who are celebrating the Chag. People who determine that this is the beginning of the month. 
And he tells us, Afil if they are kormim veyogvim, even if they are people who are just farmers in Israel. If there are Jews in Israel, any Jew in Israel who is keeping the Chag, and then if those kormim, if those who are working in the vineyards, yikve'u mo'adim al pi cheshbon, meaning when in Israel you have Jews who are keeping Pesach, who are determined that the first day of Nisan is the first day of Nisan, due to the calculations that were established in the 4th century, al yedei ze, through that, Mitkachim hamoadim bechol haolam. Through that, there's a sanctification throughout the world. It must be made by us. You cannot have holidays not made by the Jewish people. It is a day when you are, or the Chagim are a period when we're supposed to recognize our ability. We're celebrating our freedom in essence. What is our freedom? To create time, to sanctify time. How is it done? Well, we have to, it has to be done in Eretz Israel. When you have courts, it's the ideal way that it should be performed. When you don't have those courts, it could be done by Jews living in Eretz Israel and keeping the Chagim. That is why, and that is how, we have Chagim. You know, there, when they were discussing, the, the, over the past few years, they discuss a lot the nuclear threat of Iran. And while I would say 10 years ago it was a terrifying uh, topic to address, it was indeed terrifying. As humans, you know what happens. When there's something that is terrifying, but it's just always around, you get used to it. Maybe I'm the only one. That, but 10 years ago, when you would read about what Ahmadinejad you know, would say, and the fact that they're trying to get their nuclear weapons, right? And you know very, very, very well the, the depth of their hatred. We're not Westerners who are, who, who are blind to what is happening. We are people who recognize that there's such a thing called religion. We understand religion, right? Religion makes people meshuga. Religion is a very dangerous thing, right? Even Judaism could be very, very dangerous, right? This is what the Talmud always tells us, that Torah is like a sum. Torah is like a, it could be a poison or it could be a medicine. It is both. If you use it correctly, Torah is incredible. It makes very kind people, ethical people, people that respect one another. There are incredible things that Torah could do. If it's misused, oh my, you know, religious people, fanatics, right? They're the worst. Let's face it. There's nothing as dangerous as a, 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 a war, right? Or an argument where each person is 100% sure that God spoke to him. Because there's nothing, you know, how, why should I find common ground? God just told me. Very, very scary religion, right? You have to be careful with it. So we who understand what religion could do to a person, when we go ahead and we hear the messages of the Iranians, we got very, very nervous. Over time, we're hearing it over and over again, and nothing changed. It's not like they suddenly all love us because the United States... Uh, made this uh, deal with them. It didn't change their attitudes or, towards us. And odds are, odds are that you cannot change their drive uh, to get the nuclear weapon. So when we think about it, right, we get a little bit nervous. Maybe it's better not to think about it. I'm not sure. You know, we could go ahead and debate uh, the issue. So now, people enter into a philosophical question, which is an awful one, which is an awful one. Can such a thing happen? God forbid. Right? This is a, it's a terrible thing to address. And while we are very, very optimistic in general as, as, as a faith, I don't know if someone would ask me in the mid-1930s, could it ever happen, uh, what happened in Europe? I would say absolutely not. God would never allow such a thing to happen. Right? We believe in a God. We've had a relationship with him already 3,000 years. 3,500 years, and yet uh, God did conceal himself. So these are very scary things to even think about. However, what we are being told, by the way, by this teaching of the Rambam by Khatam Sofer, is actually giving a religious explanation to why it is impossible for Judaism to be around without Jews in Israel. In other words, what I really believe is that people in Israel 
are much safer than Jews anywhere else around the world. This is a, a, a belief I have. Why? Because we have, unfortunately, no guarantees. I remember as my, my mother would share with me that in Mexico, and Mexico is a little bit less stable than uh, the United States and Canada. Just a, just a touch less stable there. And my mother would, uh, would, would ask a few of you know, the Mexicans, like, you know, you know, your revolutions are not so far off, right? The lack of stability here. Are you ever concerned as a Jew of chas v'shom, what can happen? And the answer given, which is a good answer, is that one thing we did learn, we did learn from World War or from, from the Holocaust, is that as soon as something happens, we're packing up and leaving. This was the answer. It's true to an extent, because the reality is that in France, there are many people that would love to pick up and leave, but it's much easier said than done. Throughout the world, anywhere, the United States, in Canada, and we used to say Europe, but Europe already is becoming clear, so we don't even have to say so, we do not have guarantees. It's a scary statement, but it's a fact. In Israel, we have actually a religious guarantee. Says the Khatam Sofer that you should know, that since it is impossible to have Chagim without Jews in Israel, and since it is obvious that there has to be Chagim because it is what God promised the people of Israel, that we're going to have this routine that you find in the text in the Torah, Jews will always be in Israel. Because remember, if you do the math, we have to have Chagim. It's in the Chumash, right? It's part of our, it's in a calendar. It's something that it is part of our identity. It is impossible to have a Chag if there are no Jews in Israel celebrating. So therefore, it is through those Jews who are celebrating that we have a Chag. There must be their Jews there. Jews, there, and therefore he notes that it will never happen. A Kilion HaUma will not happen. And there is a guarantee for Jews in Israel. This is a statement made by the Khatam Sofer. Now, especially if you have a belief that the whole return of the 20th of the past 150 years is not random, if you see the handing of God in the fact that if you would turn to any Jewish person 120 years ago and tell them that within 120 years the largest Jewish population will be in Israel, these things were impossible, right? And the only text that indicated, the only text that indicated that such a thing will ever happen was the Tanakh. Think about it. The only text you could speak to any and every single expert 120 years ago. Is there such a possibility? And they would say, absolutely not. Impossible. But if you look at the text of our Tanakh, the text of our life, the Torah would tell us, yes, it could happen. It's obvious to me, at least, that this is a book that we could, uh, book on that we could go ahead and put our bets on. And this is an incredible statement. As it relates to our Parsha, Yovel is to remind the Jew... The Yovel is to remind the farmer the power the Jew has to create. It is something that you do. And as the Rambam tells us, if you did not blow the shofar, if you did not free the slaves, there is no Yovel. It doesn't exist. And by the way, we have a seven-year cycle in Eretz Israel. There is no Yovel. There is no Yovel, right? So some of you could perhaps remember uh, 50 years ago, right? 49 years ago, or 50 years ago as a Shemitah. Fifty years have passed. There has, been, has not been a Yovel, right? As far as I know, I mean, it's before I was born, there was no Yovel. Any of you remember, you know, fruit of Yovel, marketplace, you, you, you don't, there was no Yovel. Why was there no Yovel? Why was there yes Shemitah and no Yovel? So one explanation is, and this is actually a fact as well, is that there is only a Yovel if you have representatives of all the tribes in Israel in their ancestral land. But again, you see the idea. We have to play a role. To create a Yovel, the Jewish person has to play a role. Only then can there be a Yovel. Shabbat, Shabbat's on its own cycle. We were informed, it's a gift to the people of Israel that we are, were informed that there is a Shabbat. That is Shabbat Lashem. Yovel is the power the Jew has to create. And therefore, we, we, as farmers, you know, they were told, remember the Jubilee because you're being told of the significance and the ability to create. It gives us the understanding that the only way that we have Chagim is because we created them. And I think at least that these words of the Chatam Sofer are very encouraging words, right? 
that even though there is concern, right, it's a different type of existence now. You know, it's, it's when you study the words in the book of Yechezkel and Zechariah, and they talk about this big battle. Christians love talking about the big battle. Like, I remember in the South, where there were many people who followed the Bible, in Walmarts, they would come over and they would say, oh, I love Jews. I, the big battle's coming. Armageddon, it's on its way. The Christians love predicting and they love making movies. And they like talking about destruction that's waiting for us. It's, it seems to be so much part of their culture. As a Jew, I like believing that, yes, there is destruction, but it's behind us. Meaning, believe, was there not destruction? I mean, come on. You know, who could have imagined such destruction? So yes, there is text that describes destruction, but that is behind us. And now we are looking forward, and we are progressing, and we are progressing in the right direction on many, many, many levels. Right? We could talk about positive progression that's occurring in Israel. If you read the media, you're never going to know it. But those who visit Israel recognize that there's positive progression. You know, I talk about, often about the fact that if you listen to army songs, army gatherings, 40 years ago in Israel, 45 years ago, right, the tunes they would be singing, they were basically old secular songs about the Palmach and the Etzel. Something shifted in the Israeli army where songs are going to be religious songs. These are significant differences. You look at the amount of generals. Look at pictures of generals in the Israeli army 45 years ago, how many of them would wear a kippah? And look at, what, look at what's happening now. You know that hey, we had a, a, a family we knew well in Israel, the Greenfield family. And they lived in Bet Israel. They had like 11 kids, and they lived in like two rooms. Very nice Hasidic family, very special. And they shared with me an interesting story that when their, one of their oldest sons uh, in the Six Day War, even though he was a yeshiva student, uh, prior to the Six Day War, he decided that he's going to make his contribution to the land and he's going to join the army. This was not uh, the norm in that environment, but he joined the army. And what was beautiful about it is that he joined the army and he kept his long payas. He kept his long payas, he remained a Hasid Shayit, and he went to the army. And this is a family that was associated with Satmar in Yerushalayim. And the son went to the army. Sixth day war, he's in a tank. He's going down the Sinai. And, you know, Baruch Hashem, the miracle occurred. They get, they're ripping through the Sinai. And there was a photographer there of Life magazine. As he opens the, the, the tank and pops his head out, the photographer was shocked. Because he just saw hundreds of Israeli soldiers. And one of them shows up with pace. He was shocked to the extent that he pulled out his camera. And he took a picture. And that was on the cover of Life magazine in 1967. I don't remember 1967, but I'm sure we could go ahead and find somewhere a cover of the Life magazine of a... What was that? I remember. You remember it. So, with, with Paeus, at that time, the idea of having Paeus in the army, right? Paeus was unheard of. In other words, people sticking to their traditions to that extent in the Israeli army, Yes, you had many of the kibbutz through God, but not like the numbers of today. Today, right, if you go, you know, you talk about the Nachal Haredi, there is something changing in the land. And that's why it's always, whenever we talk about these ideas, we have to remember, we're not Christians. We don't talk about, what the, you know, the Gogu Mogo, the big battles. This is not a Jewish way of looking at things. The Jewish way is of seeing the good, seeing how things are developing, in a, progressing in the right way. Seeing the value of the land and the fact that we could be there. This is a land where we remember Shabbos and we see the power of the Jew to create with the Yovel. This is what we are supposed to do when we talk about these things. For me, I'm always, as, as a person that turns to these books and this text to find support, we have here also a guarantee. A guarantee that they will not succeed. This is a guarantee that exists in Israel, right? But no guarantee anywhere else. It's, this uh, talk is sponsored by Nefesh Benefesh. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes? Was there never a period in Israel like we're talking about, let's say after the destruction of Beit Hamikdash, where there was no Jews in Israel? Okay, good was question. Was there never a period? Good question. So we are told that after the destruction of the first, the first Beit Hamikdash, there was a 52-year, 52 52-year 52 
gap with no one there. However, the high courts, as a structure, moved to Babel and they operated there. So in other words, if indeed there would be no one in Israel, but a high court, a functional Sanhedrin, then there could be a concern. Okay? But after they returned and they rebuilt the second Bet Amidash, there has never been one hour without Jews in Eretz Israel. When Ezra returned, Ezra returned 2,500 years ago, there, and this is something that is recorded, right? The Dori Gold wrote a beautiful book about Yerushalayim. So Yerushalayim, we were actually kicked out of Yerushalayim from the year 135 into the 4th century. But in Eretz Israel, we have always been there. There has never been a gap. There have always been rabbinic authorities in Eretz Israel. Right? And we have a record of names, and there are travelers that visit there in different eras. So the answer is that from the return of Ezra, we have never had a gap. And this is what uh, we could consider as a guarantee for God. Thank you so much. Thank you for the sponsors. See you next week.